a little boy, we always had one of these in our house. I'm sure most of you have forgotten what a dictionary is because everything's on the computer now. But, um, you know, when, when I didn't know the meaning of a word, Mama said, look it up. When I didn't know how to spell it, she said, look it up. I said, Mama, how do I look it up when I don't know how to spell it? But anyway, we had dictionaries because they defined something. Amen? They told you what? They gave a description of what something meant. And uh, that's what a dictionary was for, describe something. This morning, I want to ask you, what is it that defines who you are? Or who is it that defines who you are? What is it that describes the person that you are this morning? And if you can answer that question and look in the mirror, this is who I am under God, you will have had a great day in God's house. I promise. And the Bible is full of so many things for us to look at, to look at, um, you know, that it, you know we, we can say, well, what, what, how do I describe myself? How do other people describe me? But most importantly, how does God define me? How does God define who I am? And that's the real question this morning. Uh, how does God define who you are? You know, when you, when you talk about um, what we think about ourselves in Romans chapter 12, verse 3, don't think you are better than you really are. Don't think you're really better than you are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourself. You know, God never intended for us to be haughty or arrogant or, or proud. But on the other hand, he said, Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. God intended for us to have a good, healthy self-respect and to love ourselves in this, that respect, not to put ourselves down, but to not think too highly of ourselves. We live in a world that wants to define who we are. Amen? We live in a world that wants to push us into their mold and make us like them. <clears throat> and there are a lot of areas, you know, I think particularly the entertainment industry, and I could take off on that for 30 minutes, they want to mold us into to who they want us to be. Or I could think of the fashion industry, or I might say the lack of fashion industry, that wants to describe who we are and mold us into who we are and define where we are. And it's easy to let others define us. It's easy to let other people define us. And I think the key is, am I securely grounded and rooted in who I am? Do I know who I am? Do I feel God's plan and purpose for my life? You know, I think about, it. what are the things, how do other people describe us? How do other people define us? Is it by the kind of car we drive? Or as Dixie said, the biggest truck in the parking lot? Is it where we live, the house that we live in? Is it where we work? Is it our family? It is, where we're, is it where we're from? Is it whether we wear purple and gold or red and black? Is it our grades? Is it our popularity? Are we described by our friends? Are we defined by our friends? What are those things that define who you are? All of us are defined in some way, and, and a lot of those things define who we are. And certainly it's easy to be defined by the world. You know, that's not always bad. Everything in the world is not always bad. You know, he's a good plumber, or, you know, uh, she's a good seamstress, or she's a great teacher, or, you know, he's a, he's a good businessman. Those things are not all bad. But what's at the core of who you are? how you define yourself, and most importantly, how does God define us? Are we defined by our relationship with Jesus Christ? And that's obviously my challenge this morning, that we would come to understand that we need to be defined by our relationship with Jesus Christ and how he lives in us and how he lives through us. Do the people that are around you, do they define you as a Christian? First and foremost, do they see Christ in your life? This morning I would challenge you to, to, to take this into thought. If I am the man, the woman, the youth, the child that I should be, other people will see Christ living in their lives and through our lives on a daily basis. And they'll know who we are. You know, when I die, I'm not interested in saying he was a good old boy. I hope they say he knew Jesus. That's what I want most and foremost of all. How does God define us? Um, I, I'm convinced that others will see Jesus in us if we live for him. And I'm convinced 
that all of us are role models. I want you to take this in. All of us are role models to somebody. Whether you're an adult, whether you're in the business world, whether you're in a factory, whether you're in a community, we're a role model to somebody. Young people, stay right with me. You are a role model. There's somebody that looks up to you, and all of us have a platform. All of us have a platform that we can stand on. There's something that you can do that sets you apart. You're a great salesperson. You're a great student. You, maybe you have a, a, a talent or a gift, a musical gift. All of us have a platform from which we can share Christ. So what defines you? What defines who you are and, and who you're becoming? I love the statement that Tony Dungy made, and, and I, I am a fan of his. I read everything I can get my hands on. He said this, I need, to be, I need to remind myself that the world doesn't define me. I am defined by my relationship with Jesus Christ. Here, if you, yeah, you may not be a sports fan. It doesn't matter to me. But here's a guy who reached the pinnacle of, of athletic success as a coach of a Super Bowl champion. He says, I don't want to be defined by the world. I am defined by my relationship with Jesus Christ. And if you are to define by our relationship with Jesus Christ, others will see that in their lives. It seems like in the last couple of weeks as I've tried to think about this thing, and, and uh, I don't prepare overnight, trust me, but to everywhere I went, everything I read pointed back to the same thing. Every devotion I read, it kept coming back to me. Bobby, I think God was just speaking back to me. Here's some more for you, boy. And I had to sort it all out. And I, I read this just the other day. It is not what you do as a Christian that determines who you are. It is who you are that determines what you do as a Christian. I want you to let that sink in. It is not what you do as a Christian that determines who you are. It is who you are as a Christian that determines what you do. How are you defined this morning? How do you define yourself? How do others define you? How does God define you? who you are. And I'll tell you this, I want to be defined by my relationship with Jesus Christ more than anything else in all of existence. And if I'm going to be defined by a relationship with Jesus Christ, I've got to know who he is. I've got to know his will. I've got to spend time with him. I've got to grow in my relationship with him. If I'm going to be defined at school as that girl or that guy who's a Christian, then I've got to know who Jesus is. It's interesting. People will come up to us all the time, Brian and myself, and, and they want to make an apology for why they didn't come to church. Well, I've just been busy, or, or I had to work, or I had to do this, and some good reasons, some good reasons. And I always come back with this, you know. I, I'm not so concerned about church. I want to know, are you walking with Jesus every day? That's the key. That's the key. Are you spending time with him? Do you take time to read his word? Do you take time to pray? Do you take time to seek his will? Are you in a living example? Do those around you know Christ? And I said, you know, that's the cake. Going to church is important, but it's like the icing on the cake. If you don't have that personal, daily, intimate walk with Jesus Christ, you and I will never be defined by our relationship with Jesus Christ. You with me? Amen? Amen. God wants us to have that personal relationship, that daily relationship. Going to church, yeah, it's important. That's why we're here this morning. We grow from his word. We grow from our relationship with each other. I like the words in Philippians chapter 2, and I think there Paul gives us a great description about how to define a Christian. How would you, we, we, could, we would all have 500 different opinions, I guess, but Paul's words here in Philippians 2 give a great definition of several characteristics that you and I would do well to emulate, to follow in our lives. He gives us a picture of Jesus. Look there with me in uh, Philippians chapter 2, 1 through 8. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, 
but in humility, consider others better than yourselves. Now, I'm not going to get ahead of myself, but the world doesn't teach it that, that way. The world says it's all about what I can get out of it. Each one of you should look not only to his own interest, but also the interest of others. <laughs> Verse 5. Your attitude should be the same as that of Jesus Christ. You want to be defined as a follower of Christ? Then have the attitude of Christ, who being the very nature of God, did not consider equality of God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, and being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on the cross. The first thing that stands out to me here is the, the challenge for you and I to be united with Christ and have fellowship with the Spirit. Spending time with Him. United our hearts in His will and His purpose for our life. You know, it's pretty typical. We become like those people that we hang around with, right? I mean, that's just the way it is. I have friends that are not Christian. I have friends that are not seeking God's will. But I don't spend a lot of time with them. I hang with people that are going to make me more Christ-like, that are going to teach me in God's will. And, you know, I, I just, I used to be a young people, and I love young people. And I would challenge you the way that I would challenge myself 40, 11 years ago. Hang around with people. Be influenced by people who are going to lead you in godly values. Because, yeah, they, they will define who you are. That's why when Jesus left, he says, I'm going to leave you with a comforter. I'm going to leave you the Holy Spirit to be with you and to help you grow. When Jesus rose from the grave and ascended, he didn't just leave us stranded. He said, your Holy Spirit is going to be, my Holy Spirit is going to be with you. You fellowship with the Holy Spirit. And you and I have the same opportunity to do that every day of our life, just like those in the New Testament did. We have that opportunity to fellowship. So my question to myself, and I think there always should be a mirror up here, my question to myself, am I taking time each day to fellowship with Jesus Christ? And I always hear the excuse, I don't have time. I will buy you an alarm clock. For $4.98, I can get you a great alarm clock at Walmart that will wake you up 15, 20 minutes every day and will give you time to fellowship with God. When we're, Paul says here, when we're defined with Christ, we have one spirit and we have one purpose. Isn't that our goal as Christians? To be united together? Agree on everything? No, we don't agree on everything. But we're united in our purpose. We're united in our call. We're defined as a person who follows Jesus Christ. And that's God's call for us, to be united when we are united, we are one in spirit and one in purpose. And he says, from that being united comes encouragement. Encouragement with Christ. Encouragement to me is such an important quality. Such an important characteristic. We live in a world that just loves to tear us down. Loves to beat us up. Loves to turn us in the wrong direction. And we can be an encouragement to others as well as be encouraged ourselves. Dixie was looking on the computer the other night, and my son, um, for, a long for a long time before he moved, was a member of Grace Community Church just outside of Asheville, North Carolina. And the pastor was writing in on Facebook and sharing his heart because in the school system there now in North Carolina, they are no longer allowed to have a fellowship of Christian athletes meeting in the school with a, with a coach or a faculty member. Their teachers are no longer, listen with me now, their teachers are no longer allowed to go to baccalaureate because that identifies them with Christianity. The church was taking up backpacks to give to the students, but they can't do that because it comes from a Christian organization. I mean, where are we headed? We have got to take a stand and, and, and be defined as persons of Jesus Christ. We do. We do. And, and, and as I read that, I, I, I just grieve. I grieve. If they mention God, they're fired. They're done. We're talking about 
two states away in the United States of America. My friend, God has called us to be defined as Christians. And we're going to take persecution for that. As students, there are going to be people who don't understand. They're going to think you're wacko. That's okay. That's all right. God loved you and sent Jesus to die for you. And God gave us an opportunity to share Christ. And my prayer is that we'll encourage others. That we'll be defined as a person who's a Christian. And if you're walking with Christ in your work daily, in your community, there are people who know that. And when they have a need, when they have a problem, they're going to come to you. Because you're defined as a follower of Christ. And that's God's call for your life. That's God's call for my life. And I could look around the room, and I know your professions. I don't, I'm not here to pick on any one person. But, but everybody has a different role. Everybody has a different role. And there's encouragement from being united with Christ. And he says, Paul says, <clears throat> when we're defined in our relationship with Christ and united, then there's a comfort in his love. You know, we all want to be loved, don't we? We all want to be uh, affirmed and appreciated. And God's love is perfect. First John tells us that God is love, you know. And we have an opportunity to share the love of Christ with others. And when you and I are defined as Christians, those opportunities will come readily. And we want people to see the love of Christ in us, encouragers and, and, and comforters of his love. The world doesn't understand that love. The world is, you hit me, I'm going to punch you right back out. And God says, turn the other cheek and love faithfully. And he be I believe that. And he says there's tenderness and there's compassion. When you and I are rightly relying with Christ, when we're defined as a Christian, we'll have tenderness, we'll have compassion. We'll see the needs of others. We'll respond to the needs of others. And I'm here to tell you, wherever you are in life, whether you're at the, in the business world, in the professional world, you work at the hospital, you're in the school system, whatever you do, people should see that you're a different person, that I'm a different person. They should define you as a follower of Jesus Christ, to have tenderness, compassion, to be empathetic, to see the needs of others. That's what happens when you and I are united with Christ. The heart of Christ becomes our heart. I can't love completely unless I love God completely, unless his love lives in my life. And that's God's call for us, is to have tenderness, compassion, and to complete joy. He says, be like-minded. Be like-minded at one spirit, one love, and one in purpose. I thought about our church, Elkhorn Baptist Church. How are we defined in the community? Are we defined as a, as a church that's together and walking together and working together? Just yesterday I was at the funeral home in Hodgeville, Kentucky, and somebody, a very prominent gentleman in this community says, I hear great things are happening in Elkhorn. I said, yeah, it's going pretty good. You know, it's going pretty good. We're defined by our walk with Christ. We're defined by how he lives in our life. And our church is defined by our walk with Christ. That doesn't mean we're all united as a bunch of clones. That would be a mess. But we're, there's, uni there's unity in our diversity. There's strength in our not being all the same. This morning I would just ask you the question. Are you defined? as one who is united with Christ and fellowships with the Spirit. Think about that. You answer that question. Am I defined as one who is united with Christ and walks in fellowship with the Spirit? The next thing that comes to mind here in this passage is the unselfishness that God calls for us. God calls us as Christians to be defined as unselfish persons, as persons who... Think about the needs of others. He says here, Paul says, don't be, don't be caught up in selfish ambition. Don't be conceited in who you are. Don't be self-centered because self-centeredness and self-ambition will destroy us. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't need to be concerned about ourselves. Certainly we do. But we need to look out for the needs of others. We need to care for the needs of others. And I've said this before and I say it many times. People ask me all the time about Elkhorn. And these are what I say. This is what I answer. Loving, giving, caring, sharing, and non-judgmental. That's who my church, that's who my church is. That's what defines 
in my mind, Elkhorn Baptist Church. Loving, giving, caring, sharing, non-judgmental. Yeah? Amen? God, God calls us to be unselfish. Jesus never sought to elevate himself. He, he was in touch with the Father's will for his life. He respected others. He always respected others created in the image of God. No one was beneath, stay with me here, no one was beneath God reaching out to them through Jesus Christ. Several years ago, we were in um, Atlanta, Georgia for a coaches convention. And some of you have been to underground Atlanta. It's kind of an interesting place, yeah. There's a city literally underneath the city. And uh, we had been walking around, and, and uh, it's, it's a little bit on the, would you say wild side, maybe? It's a little different. And, uh, I mean, one guy comes up to my buddy um, and, and asks ask him for money for food. And you know how that goes. He said, no, but I'll take you and buy you something to eat. And he took him and bought him food. And then uh, we'd been there eating a little while, and, and I decided I need to use the restroom. So I'm going somewhere with this, so hang on. So uh, I needed to use the restroom, so I walked all the way to the end of the underground mall, and I found the restroom. And when I got in there, there was about six guys in there with their hoods on, pulled up over their heads, kind of standing in the corner like this. I decided I didn't need to use the restroom as bad as I thought. <laughs> so I walked back down to the end, and I said, Coach Graves, man, you've got to take me to the bathroom. <laughs> Now, this boy wasn't going in there by myself. I'm going to tell you that. No way. But when I got back to Campbellsville, later on I explained it to one of the other coaches that were in the university, and I told him what had happened. Here's what he said. He said, you have to understand, underground Atlanta is filled with the scum of the earth. Yeah, that might be true, but Jesus died for them just like he died for me. And I hope, I hope that I will be defined as a person who was unselfish. Nobody was beneath my reaching out to. No, I was never better than anyone else. And I think that's God's call for us. I think that's what Paul teaches us here. Don't be unselfish. Don't be unselfish. Jesus never looked down on anyone. He never held back from helping someone in need. He put the needs of others first. That's why Paul said, consider others better than yourself. He didn't mean that you don't have a, a healthy self-respect. That's not what he said. Keep it in perspective. But be sensitive to the needs of others. And I can look around this room and I see you folks that are giving, caring, sharing, cooking meals, delivering meals, making visits, doing those kind of things that are unselfish in, 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 uh, in our call for our lives. We're called to reach out to the needs of others. How about you this morning? Are you, stay with me here, are you defined as a person who is unselfish? Are you defined as a person who is unselfish? That's what Paul says that Jesus was. And then I love that the, in verse 5, it says, have, have the attitude of Jesus Christ. Now I'm big about attitude. Attitude is a huge thing for me. I think attitude affects everything that we do whether it be in the workplace or the schoolroom, on, on, on the athletic court, wherever we are. We watched the news this week, as some of you may have, on this, this cruise ordeal, those folks out off of Alabama. And, <clears throat> you know, some of them, um, when you ask how it went, everything was terrible, everything was bad, it was disaster, you know, blah, blah, blah. And other ones came up and said, yeah, it was rough, but God was with us. Amen. Amen. Nobody got, nobody died. Nobody drowned. The boat didn't sink. I'm so blessed just to be here. And Dixie looked over at me and she said, boy, isn't it all about attitude? Isn't it all about attitude? Paul says here, have the attitude of Christ. How are you going to be defined? The people that are around you, are they going to define you as one who has the attitude of Jesus Christ? That's big stuff. That's huge. That's huge. I hope that people will say, boy, he might have been goofy but he sure loved Jesus. He had the attitude of Jesus. He, he saw the needs of others. And I think that's just so, so critical, so important. Jesus said, I have come to do your will. My friend, you and I have to know God's will before we can do God's will. Amen? And that's so crucial. Just think about this. What? 
What, what if the world had the attitude of Jesus Christ? It would be a different world. But let me throw this one at you. What if all Christians had an attitude of Jesus Christ? We would live in a different world if all Christians had an attitude of Jesus Christ. And I have to know who he is. If I'm going to be defined as a follower of Christ, I've got to know him. I've got to walk with him. I've got to fellowship with him. I've got to spend time with him. And I want to have his attitude. If you're an athlete, athletes take on the attitude of their coach. You watch that. You watch that. Attitudes take on... I mean, athletes take on the attitude of their coach. I want to take on the attitude of Jesus Christ. That's my goal. That's my desire. In 1 in Corinthians 2, it says this. We can have the mind of Christ. That blows my mind. I can grow so close in my relationship with Jesus Christ that I can begin to think like he thinks. And that's my, that's my desire. That's my goal. That's how I want to be defined. As someone who thinks the way Jesus Christ thinks. And then it says in verse 6 that Jesus became a servant. He was God. He had the very nature of God. He tells us in John chapter 10 verse 30, I and the Father are one. He was one with the Father. He was equal with God. Yet he allowed himself to become human for you and for me. He took on the form of a servant. It was voluntary surrender. He wasn't forced to do that. We need, we need to really understand that. Jesus was not forced to be a servant. He wasn't forced to die on the cross. He chose to be obedient and do that. He was a, he was a servant. In Romans 15, he did not seek to selfishly please himself. He was totally submissive to the will of the Father. And he set aside his own desires for you and for me. He was sinless, yet he took on your sin and he took on my sin that I might be forgiven, that I might be redeemed, and that I might have a home in eternity with Jesus Christ. Jesus was a servant. This morning, can you be, would you be defined as one who is a servant of Jesus Christ? And then in verse 8, the word humility comes up. You know, humility is an interesting term. Many times when we think of humility, we think of weakness. We think of weakness. Humility is not weakness. Humility is perspective of how we view things, how we view who we are. And the Bible says that Jesus, I mean, keep in mind, Jesus was God, but yet he was humble. He was humble. He never sought to elevate himself. He never sought to seek his own agenda. He could have done that. It wasn't about my rights, and that's what we hear in our society today. It's all about me. Jesus wasn't like that. Not at all. Not at all. He could have, but he said this in John chapter 5, I seek to please him who sent me. How about you this morning? Is that your testimony? Could you say, you know, I'm seeking, my, I'm seeking to please my father. I'm living my life to please my father. My friend, if you and I would take on that goal for our lives, what a different life we would have and what a different life this would be in our community. So this morning, are you defined as a person who is humble the way Jesus was humble? That's his call for us. That's his call. And then in verse 8, it said he was obedient. You know, obedience is interesting. Obedience is not something that usually comes natural for many folks. It's certainly not something that comes easy for a child. Any of us that have ever, you know, had the privilege of having children, obedience is something we have to teach. It doesn't just come by second nature. Um, and yet Jesus was obedient. He was obedient all the way to, to the cross. And there's a verse in, Roman, in Hebrews chapter 5 that really caught my attention. I want, you, I want you to stick with this. Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. Don't forget this. You talk about obedience. Well, well, he was obedient because he was God. Well, he was obedient because that's what he had to do. That's not what my, my scripture tells me. In Hebrews chapter 5 verse 8. Although he was a son, he did what? You with me, Aaron? 
Not yet. Although he was a son, he learned obedience. He learned obedience. And he became the source of eternal salvation to all to obey him. My friend, if Jesus had to learn to be obedient to the Father, how much more so do you and I need to learn to be obedient to the Father? This morning, how are you defined? Are you defined as a person who is obedient to your Heavenly Father? There are six things here this morning that I think have a great impact on how you and I are defined, and, and I hope you will, you will look at your life in light of these things. Are you defined as one who is united with Christ and has fellowship with Christ? Are you defined as one who is unselfish in the way that you live your life? Are you defined as one who has an attitude of Jesus Christ in the way you deal with others? Are you defined as a servant who reaches out to meet the needs of others? Are you designed, designed, defined as one who is humble in your relationship with others? And are you defined as a person who is obedient in God's call for your life? A few weeks ago when I talked about Hebrews 5 and 6, chapter 3, 5 and 6, you know, it really struck me, and I haven't forgotten that. I listen to, my, to myself once in a while. I haven't forgotten that. When it says, you know, trust in the Lord and all your heart, lean not on your understanding, all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. But he will direct us, but we have to be obedient. We have to choose to follow his will for our life. How are you defined this morning? How do you measure up to these six qualifications? My friend, if you and I measure up and we follow these things, we'll be a witness to a lost world. The community that you live in will be different. Your home will be different. Your workplace will be different. Your schoolhouse will be different. And God calls you, he calls me, and he calls each of us to do those things. Do those qualifications fit you? Do you remember Peter and John in, in Acts, in the book of Acts, and it said the folks around them recognized that they had been with Jesus? How about you this week? Will people that you are around all week recognize that you've been with Jesus? Are you defined as a person who walks with Jesus and on a daily basis? And you know, through that all, through that whole thing, no matter how you define yourself, no matter how others define us, the key is, how does God define us? That's, that's the real key. That's the real key. You know, lately it seems like I guess I'm getting old. I always wondered why people didn't like to be home. I mean, didn't like to be away from home. I don't enjoy going and staying away much anymore. And when we go on a trip, I have my checklist. Anybody, I don't know anybody else ever does this or not. You know, check the doors, check the windows, make sure the coffee pot's off, make sure the extra heater's off, uh, cut the water off so that it doesn't freeze or pipe doesn't burst like it has in the past. You know, I have my, did I say check the coffee pot? And then, uh, then we get down the road, and I drive down the road a little while. Dixie, did you get the door? By the way, did we get the coffee pot? And then I drive back. Anybody ever do that? <laughs> yeah. All right. I don't feel so bad now. Here's the deal. Here's the deal. What's really hit me between the eyes in the last year or so, and I have been around death a lot through the opportunities that I've had in this ministry, life is a one-way trip. I'm worried that my house is going to be intact when I get back. But my friend, I'm going to take a trip someday. And there's no coming back. It doesn't matter about my house. It doesn't matter. But the key is, am I defined by my relationship with Jesus Christ? Do I know Him as my Lord and Savior? Have you come to the place this morning in your life where you can say, I know, but I know, but I know. I have trusted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. If I were to die today, I'm going to heaven. I have no doubt. And I'll see my loved ones waiting for me. And are you to the place where you say, I know that those people around me define me as a Christian. Yes, I'm a businessman. Yes, I'm a businesswoman. Yes, I'm in a professional realm. But the people around me define me first and foremost 
not by my skills, not by my talents, but by my relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what I want for my life. That's what I want for my life. We had the opportunity yesterday to go up to Hodgenville, Kentucky. A dear friend of mine that I worked with for many years, Sylvia Morris, uh, will be buried this afternoon. And uh, when, I, when I looked at the obituary, when I looked at the, the printout of all the things that she had accomplished, I have no idea. I mean, accolades, awards, organizations, accomplishments. And then it just hit me. None of those really matter anymore. What really matters is my friend in my heart and mind was defined as a lady committed to Jesus Christ. And as I sat there, yeah, yeah. And as I sat there and I read that, here was my thinking. What's going to be said about me when I die? What about of the few awards and the accolades and the places I've been and what I've done? Was it because I was Haywood or because I was Mr. Reiner or, or Coach Reiner or Brother Reiner? Those things mean nothing. It's all about being defined as knowing Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior. Amen? This morning, as we share together, let God speak to your heart. How are you defined this morning? Are you defined as a follower of Jesus Christ? If you've never made that decision, you can say, I'm not sure. I'm not complete. I don't know how I'm defined. Let's get that straight today. Let's make that decision. Let's invite Jesus into our heart. Let's ask for forgiveness. And let's ask for God to reveal his plan and purpose for our lives. Those six qualities are great things for you and I to be defined by. Is Jesus Christ your personal Lord and Savior? Have you been defined as a follower of Christ? Am I defined as walking with Christ each day? Let's stand and share together. This altar is open. You need to make a decision. You need to get your life defined as a follower of Christ.